Amen, amen. All glory be to our King. Thank you, Gary. All right. Parents, if you're dismissing your children to children's church, they may go at this time. That's age three to third grade dismissing out the back with our children's ministry director, Jen Smith, returning before the end of the service. Uh, for everyone else, if you have your Bible, grab the bulletin on the way in. At least have your phone turn, open or click. We are in Hebrews chapter six this morning, looking at verses 13 to the end of the chapter. If you are just joining us, we have been studying the letter to the Hebrews this fall, and we come this morning to what will be our final installment of that series for the year. Next week begins uh, Advent. As we turn our hearts towards uh, Christmas, we'll be picking up Hebrews again in uh, January. Um, and uh, as you're making your way there, just want to give a quick update on my uh, daughter. Last sermon I preached a couple of weeks ago, uh, we left our sweet little girl, Elsie, uh, in the hospital where uh, she was receiving some treatment for, among other things, low hemoglobin. Uh, and I'm happy to report she's received uh, great care, great treatment, doing much, much better. Still waiting a more definitive diagnosis, but all signs point uh, to in a very, very good direction for very courage. Thank you, church, though. Thank you. We feel so loved. We have felt so loved by this uh, by this, this body of, of Christ. And often it is in times of crisis and suffering where the body of Christ uh, really shines. So thank you so much. We are just, I am so loved uh, as a pastor and just want you to know how much I appreciate you and appreciate this congregation. Um, as we come to uh, Hebrews uh, this morning, this is, I, I hope you will find, a very encouraging uh, passage. We have been studying Hebrews all fall and uh, there's a bit of a tension that exists exist in the letter to the, the Hebrews. On, on the one hand, uh, we've got some of the more serious uh, warnings in the entire Bible. And I want to be careful not to overstate my point because Jesus had some serious things to say as well. But the letter of Hebrews uh, contains some very sobering warnings. We've considered the, uh, the danger of spiritual drift, uh, the danger of growing a hard heart, even within the church. Pastor Dave did an excellent job last week of uh, working through a difficult passage, the danger of uh, falling away. Uh, and, uh, so we need to look at those things, look at them square in the face, but uh, sometimes even, not even in the same paragraph, but even in the same sentence, in the same uh, verse, we get passages like we have this morning full of tremendous hope, tremendous encouragement, a picture for us of how it is that we are to live the Christian life boldly uh, entering before God, before the throne of, of grace. You see, the topic this morning is, uh, is hope, the hope set before us. Let's pray as we prepare our minds, prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Father, I'm not sure how we uh, arrive here this, this morning, perhaps uh, slightly worn out from already a busy season, uh, maybe distracted by the things of the world, maybe just weary and tired uh, in our flesh. Uh, we know that the enemy uses these things, uses these things to, uh, to distract uh, our hearts, distract our minds from the gospel, uh, from the food that we need this morning, the spiritual food. Uh, so I pray, uh, Jesus, through the work of your spirit, that you would uh, tune our, our minds and tune our hearts to you and to your word. Help us to receive what you have for us, what you have for your, your people. Uh, even this morning, pray that you'd help me to be uh, clear, help me to be faithful in expounding uh, this text that is before us. Uh, Jesus, we pray for that spiritual work to be done. Do that in this congregation. Do that in the individuals who sit here. Do that uh, amongst those who are weary and tired and, and worn out, carrying some heavy burden upon their shoulders. Help us to see this glorious, glorious hope that we have uh, in you. And so do this, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Follow along with me as I read our sermon passage, Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast 
to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. Uh, the title that I've given to the sermons you see here is The Hope That Is Set Before Us. Uh, we're going to think for the next 30 minutes on this topic of uh, hope. Uh, hope that is uh, for those who have fled to Jesus, who have Jesus as a sure and steadfast anchor uh, of, the, of the soul. This is what we want to uh, wrap our minds around uh, this morning. And uh, More than that, this is spiritual work that we're doing. This isn't just intellectual work. This isn't just rational work. We want to not just wrap our minds but settle our hearts into the hope of the gospel, this hope that is presented um, in this passage. And let me begin by calling your attention down to verses, uh, verse 18, verse 18 and 19, kind of the main focus of the sermon this morning, where we read this, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Uh, this passage contains an invitation uh, for us as we sit here this morning and take this in. It's an invitation to flee to Jesus. I'll remind you that uh, throughout the letter to Hebrews, he's asked us to consider Jesus, to see Jesus, and now we have perhaps the most uh, active invitation, uh, yet it is to flee to him. And in fleeing to Jesus, we are to discover for ourselves the sure and steadfast uh, hope, the hope that he offers. Um, and so that's where we're going. That's where we're headed. The first thing that we need to say about hope uh, most fundamentally is that it involves expectation, right? So we try to wrap our minds around uh, just the nature of hope in general. Uh, at the very least, very base level, uh, we need to get this straight that hope involves uh, expectation. Uh, hope necessarily uh, kind of lifts us out of our present circumstances. Hope looks forward, kind of looks uh, over the horizon at something yet to come, beyond the present uh, moment. Um, and of course, this is good news for us because our present moment, uh, this present moment that uh, you and I occupy uh, right now, certainly is full of uh, a lot of darkness, uh, isn't it? We can say that uh, historically, uh, maybe specifically for the, the specific date, the specific time in which we live, although I imagine that's probably been true of every age, we have always probably felt that we live in darkness. Uh, Christian philosopher Charles Taylor, maybe some of you know him, he wrote a very uh, influential book a number of years ago called Our Secular Age. Uh, and he refers to the time in which you and I live as the age of anxiety. An age of anxiety, maybe you've heard that uh, phrase before, uh, trying to put his finger on uh, the pulse of our culture, uh, calling out the fear and the worry uh, that tends to drive uh, our lives, drive our lives on a personal level, uh, drive our lives on a societal level, and uh, Jamie, one of the things that's giving me anxiety is this microphone right now. Am I really loud out there? Can I just move it? Just move it. There we go. Ah, hey, the sermon just got 5% better. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so many fears and uh, worries can, uh, can just occupy our minds, occupy our, uh, our hearts. I read uh, just earlier this week the, uh, the, in the New Yorker, there was an article entitled um, The Morality of Having Kids in a Burning, Drowning World. Uh, fascinating uh, opinion pieces. The, the author's uh, contention as she reflects on two books that have been written recently about uh, global warming and uh, sea level rise. Uh, she asked the question, is it right, uh, is it right for us to continue to have children? Not, not just is it, is it wise, but is it a matter of good and evil for us to continue to propagate the human race given the fact that we are supposedly uh, destroying the world through global warming and the eventual rise of the sea. Now, don't miss the point. Uh, this is not a sermon on global warming and whether or not it's caused by uh, humans or not. I promise you if that ever comes up in, the, in a Bible passage I preach, we'll preach a whole sermon uh, on that. Uh, the, the, the point is, as we look out at the world and we look out at how messed up the world is, uh, there are some serious voices, serious people in the world who are saying maybe we should just give up uh, altogether. 
Right? Do, do you realize how dark that is? That we should just cease to exist as a human race because the world is so messed up. Yes, indeed, I think we live in pretty uh, dark, dark times. Um, and I'll return to what I said earlier. Hope is about expectation. Hope is about what lies uh, over the horizon. Uh, your life today will be directed in good measure by what you expect to happen tomorrow, right? Y y our lives uh, are directed by what we hope for, what we expect tomorrow will be like. And of course, herein lies the fundamental problem. The entire world in which you and I live lives under the shadow of death. Uh, there is supposedly just one certainty uh, in life, and it is that we will all die. Uh, that we will all die fills us with some measure of anxiety. I suppose we, our days are numbered. We will die. The world will uh, continue, at least for some time. It fills us maybe with some bit of anticipation as to exactly when that day uh, will arrive. Um, and then we read this in verse 18. We who have fled for refuge might find strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. What we're trying to wrap our minds around and settle our hearts into this morning is this hope of the gospel. This hope that can direct uh, our lives. A kind of hope that lifts us out of our present circumstances. A hope that's richer and deeper than anything that the world can offer to us. And as we look at our passage, I want you to see three uh, fundamental truths, three gospel truths that I believe if we really grasp it, not just with our minds, but with our heart, would inevitably produce hope within us. That we would be able to, even as you walk out those doors this morning, get a firm grasp on this hope that is set before us. And if we get a grip on this hope that is set before us, I believe it will change our lives. So here are the, here are the three tr fundamental truths. Truths. Number one, God keeps his promises. Number two, God is true to his purposes. And then we'll finish by reflecting uh, just briefly on God offering to us his presence. Three foundational stones, three fundamental things that should produce hope within us. So we begin with number one, uh, God keeps his promises. God keeps his promise. This is uh, most basically the thrust of the passage that I'm preaching through this morning. See how many times, if you have your Bible sitting on your lap, see how many times that word promise is repeated here in the context of God making this promise to, uh, to Abraham. This is a foundational, a fundamental truth. God keeps his promises. We believe in a God who keeps his promises promises. This is uh, one of those things that is so fundamental, so foundational to kind of reuse one of the analogies we've, uh, we've gotten quite a bit of use out of. It's, it's one, of those, one of those blocks that lies at the bottom of the Jenga tower, right? One of those things that if we cease to believe this or the enemy causes us to doubt the truthfulness of whether or not God keeps his promises, you wiggle that loose on the entire tower stands uh, ready to collapse and fall in upon itself. Now, we believe that God keeps his promises. If there is not a God who stands outside of history, who exists beyond our material existence, who not only makes promises, but has the ability and indeed the willingness to keep promises, then friends, we have no hope. We have no hope. And I know as you sit here uh, this morning, maybe some of you say, yes, 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 I came all the way to church this morning for the pastor to tell me God keeps his promises. I already knew that. I already knew that. Uh, well, maybe we know it with our minds, but I want to challenge you, do you know it in your heart? I want to say to you as well, I'll tell you, your secular neighbors, right, those friends and, and family members that maybe you had Thanksgiving meal uh, with this week, certainly don't believe that, particularly those who've given up on all this religious stuff, right? For, for those who have rejected all this religious stuff, what reason do they have to believe that tomorrow will be any better than today? What reason does a secular person have to believe that history in any meaningful sense is moving in a good direction? Actually, right, the fundamental kind of laws of science would say otherwise, right, that, that the entire universe is more moving from, uh, from order, into chaos. That even the, even the sun uh, around which the, the earth uh, orbits will one day just descend into absolute chaos. It will burn up all of its hydrogen cells. The, the sun will be no more. The earth will collapse in upon itself. What a positive view of the universe that is. What reason does a secular person have to believe that tomorrow will be any better than today? What reason does a secular person have to believe that we are moving towards anything glorious, anything wonderful over the horizon? 
if there is not a God who A, exists, and B, makes promises, and C, has the ability and the willingness to keep those promises, then friends, we have no hope. All we have is today. All we have is today. And is this not the hope uh, that the world offers to us, right? The hope that the world ha- offers to us, the hope of our secular neighbor is just to live for uh, today. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was watching the movie Groundhog's Day. Anyone ever uh, you seen that movie? I'm somewhat ashamed to admit that that's probably, uh, well, it's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. I've got a very short memory. Maybe I just don't remember many movies. But I love Groundhog's Day. It's one of those movies because of the nature of it. You can just watch it over and over and over again. It's like you've never seen it before. Um, If you don't know the movie, Bill Murray, he gets stuck in uh, Punxsutawney, uh, Pennsylvania on Groundhog's Day. And uh, he kind of repeats that same day over and over again. And what I love about the movie is it goes through kind of man's search for meaning. Almost goes straight through the book of Ecclesiastes as Bill Murray tries to find meaning, tries to find purpose for his existence, and uh, the end result is always the same. It's always shallow. He's always left dissatisfied. And the turning point of the movie comes, right, when, you know what, the turning point comes when he finally just gives up, right? He gives up living for tomorrow, gives up any hope that tomorrow will be any better than today. He chooses just to do good and to be good in that particular moment. And it warms our heart. That same message is repeated in so many uh, Uh, movies, uh, much more recent movies as well. And to be clear, I think there is a measure of truth in that. There's a measure of happiness to be found in that. And if we live in a flat universe, if we live in a world where there is no God, then that's the only hope that we have, right? Just live for today. Try to get as much as you can out of today. Let's squeeze eternity out of this present moment that we have because that's all we have. Friends, that is the hope that the world offers to us. But we see in this passage a hope that points us to something so much more wonderful and something so much more glorious than anything today can offer. And that's what we're seeking to unpack here this morning. The first foundation stone is this, that God keeps his promises. I have hope for tomorrow because God keeps his promises. Verse 13 For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. So we look to Abraham here. We look to Abraham. Abraham of the Old Testament as an example of someone who experienced this hope that we're talking about here this morning. And Abraham is a very fitting example of a man filled with hope, particularly when we consider the kind of circumstances uh, of uh, his life. Uh, What what reason did Abraham have uh, for hope that wasn't just for today? It was because he believed in a God who keeps his promises for today tomorrow. Uh, And I want you to notice the specific promise that God uh, makes to Abraham. We see it there in verse 14. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. This is a good summary of the promise that is repeated to Abraham over and over in the Genesis narrative. If you know that story, you know that it's repeated many times. Uh, But here uh, in uh, Hebrews, um, it's quoting for us the promise that's repeated in Genesis chapter 22 verse 17. So if you have your Bible, keep your finger there in Hebrews. And I want you to turn to Genesis Genesis 22, uh, 17, or pull it up on your phone so that you can see this with your, uh, with your own eyes. Uh, now remember the story of Abraham, right? He and his wife Sarah uh, are called to leave the comfort of their home, uh, leave everything that they know. God calls them to go into the unknown, to go to the promised land, the land of Canaan, where they're going to become God's people. Um, this promise is uh, repeated to Abraham over and over again that God is going to make him into a great nation. He calls Abraham, he says, look down at the sand beneath your feet, your children one day, your descendants will be more numerous than the grains of sand beneath your feet, a greater in quantity than the stars above your head. What a wonderful promise. What a glorious promise. What wonderful hope. There's just one problem, right? 
his wife, Sarah, was unable to have uh, children. She was, uh, the scripture says, barren. And not only was she barren, but as we follow the story, we know that Abraham and Sarah, when this promise were given, were really, really old. When the apostle Paul retells this story, for instance, in Romans chapter 4, uh, he says concerning Abraham, and I quote, Abraham was as good as dead. How would you love that to be said about you? <laughs> you are as good as dead. Abraham is good as dead. Sarah is good as dead. Unable to have children. God makes this seemingly ridiculous promise that Abraham and Sarah are one day going to have more descendants than the sand underneath their feet, than the stars above their sky. What a, uh, what a wonderful promise. And then of course, right, Isaac is born. Sarah does give birth, birth to a child. His name is Isaac, the child of promise. But then what happens? Genesis Chapter 22 uh, happens. If you know Genesis chapter 22, God comes to Abraham one day and he says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. You see this in the beginning of Genesis chapter 22. Take that son whom you love, your only son. Take him to the mountain which I will show you and offer him up as a burnt sacrifice. Now, I wonder what kind of hope Abraham had in that moment. What reason did Abraham have for hope for today if God does not keep his promises for tomorrow? And Genesis 22 tells us that Abraham is faithful. Abraham goes to that mountain. He takes the boy, climbs up to the mountain, binds the, the boy, has the knife in his hand ready to carry out uh, God's command when at the last moment God sends the angel of the Lord to stop him in his tracks. The boy Isaac is uh, untied. A ram is found caught uh, in the thicket. The ram is slaughtered in place of Isaac. And it is here, right, in this context, Genesis chapter 22 verse 17, that God repeats this, this promise that had been made to Abraham for many years. Surely I will bless you and I will multiply you. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. If the only hope, listen to me, if the only hope that Abraham had was the hope of today, just live for this moment right here, does it make any sense for him to have the kind of faith that he had? To pursue the kind of obedience that he pursued? The kind of surrender that he displayed? It is only when I know that God keeps his promises for tomorrow that I can truly live for today. We want faith and hope like Abraham. We need to hold on to this, that God keeps his promises. And thus Abraham, verse 15, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. God keeps his promises. Abraham believed this. Abraham received this. As we seek to live lives full of hope. This is a building block for us. Church, can I ask you in your heart of hearts, do you believe this? That God keeps his promises. He not only makes promises, but he keeps his promises. Maybe as a congregation we need to take a step back though and not just, not just ask you, do you believe that God keeps his promises? But can I ask you fundamentally, do you know what God's promises are? Do you know what God has promised to do for you personally? What he has promised to do for his people? What he's promised to do for, uh, for his church? How can I put my faith in the promises of God if I don't even know what they are? I remember reading a number of years ago a book by Andrew Murray's pastor back in the 1800s. Uh, it was called With uh, Christ in the School of Prayer. And he tackles this issue that I frequently have had in prayer. Of sometimes I sit down to pray and I don't know what to pray for. And he says when you sit down to pray and you don't know what to pray for, you have to just pray for God's promises. Right, right. Search the scriptures and find what God has promised to do for you, what he's promised to do for your family, what he's promised to do for his church, what he's promised to do for us, and pray those things. Uh, friends, maybe we do need to back up and say, not only do I believe that God keeps his promises, do I know what God's promises are? What's going on in your life right now? What pain, what suffering, what headache, what heartache, what uncertainty did you bring with you to church this morning? Can I ask you, right, do you know what God's promises are for you in those situations? Are you praying uh, into those things? 
Maybe you take this as your assignment uh, for the week as you read, uh, read your Bible this week. Read it, not just looking for the commands. Read it, not just looking for the examples to follow, but read it looking for the promises that God has issued to us in his word and hitch your hope on that. You want to be a hopeful person. You want to have that kind of hope that lifts you out of the mess that you're in. Friends, we need to know his promises and we need to cling to, to this idea that God can keep his promises. So that's foundational uh, stone number one. God keeps his promises. Number two, um, as we seek to to build uh, hope within us, we need to know this, that God is true uh, to his purposes. He keeps his promises, yes, but he's also true uh, to his purposes. Look at verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. With a, with a promise. Uh, we, we understand uh, that God's purposes, God's purposes are those things which drive God's uh, promises. Uh, pr- uh, purposes for his church. Purposes for your life. Purposes right for your family. Purposes for your world will prevail no matter what. God's purposes for your life will prevail no matter what. You want to be a person of hope, we hold on to that truth, that God's purposes will prevail no matter what. Why is this so important? Let's trace the line of thought right, laid out right here in our passage. Uh, look at verse 14 again. This foundational promise made to Abraham, surely I will bless you and multiply you. I'll bless you and multiply you. Now that should be very familiar language, not just if you're familiar with Abraham, but if you're familiar with the whole uh, kind of flow of the Bible, because this is, uh, this is a, a purpose given to man uh, that's been reiterated from Genesis all the way to Revelation. So let's, let's just very briefly trace this line of thought. We're fresh from studying Genesis together. Genesis 1 one twenty-eight. Uh, we studied this several months ago, I suppose. God speaks to Adam and Eve uh, in the garden, and he breathes that fundamental purpose into humanity, tells Adam and Eve why they exist. Genesis one twenty-eight, a very important verse. We call it the creation mandate or the cultural mandate. It says, and God blessed them. God blessed Adam and Eve, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, right? This was humanity's purpose, that they would be blessed and be multiplied and they would fill the earth. That they're made in the Imago Dei, they're made in the image of God, they reflect God's glory. God intends to see his glory extend to the ends of the earth. The real kicker of the entire Bible is he intends to do that through humanity. He tends to do that through you and I. You're not going to hear this anywhere else other than the church, that it is through humanity, through you and I, that God seeks to extend his glory. What a wonderful purpose uh, that God has for us. But then what happens? As we read the story of the Bible, what happens? You turn the pages of Genesis. Genesis 3 happens. Sin happens. Death happens. Rebellion happens. And in the midst of that fall, there is an aching question. An aching question, I believe, is probably on every one of our hearts, right? Will God's purposes prevail? Does he still intend to bless me? Does he still intend to see his glory extend to the end of the earth through people like you and I. In other words, maybe more, more fundamentally, we can ask, ask it this way. Will my sin negate the purposes of God? Will the sin of man cancel out the purposes of God? And as you follow the story of the Bible, the answer to that, what do you think? The answer to that is a resounding no. No, no, no. God repeats this purpose over and over again in the Bible. Repeats it to Noah, reminding Noah that that is still his purpose. Be be fruitful. Multiply. When we get here to Abraham, most importantly, he's repeating that fundamental purpose given to Adam and Eve all the way back in Genesis 1. I will bless you. I will multiply you. Uh, Why is this so important for us to understand? Because we must understand how God's purposes, how God promises work. In other words, does the promise of God depend on the adequacy of Abraham or does it depend on the faithfulness of God? Can your sin negate God's purposes for you? And I don't know what your opinion of Abraham is, but if you really read that Genesis story, you need to know that man was messed up, right? That man was messed up. Treated his wife uh, awfully. I don't need to repeat all of the things that happened there. Had an affair. Had a a kid with another woman. (laughs) Think about all the things that Abraham did to his wife. And even in the midst of that, 
God reminds him, my purpose is for you, remain. Friends, our sin can't cancel out God's purposes. We can't thwart his purposes. Let me bring this home for you. I believe that many of us read our Bible and we come across these purposes, we come across these promises, and we read them as if there's a little asterisk there. We, we read these wonderful and glorious things that God intends to do uh, to us, through us. We think there's an asterisk there that says, you know, except for Billy Haynes. <laughs> you know, he's really messed up. <laughs> there's no asterisk in the Bible. Because your sin is not that great that God's purposes won't ultimately Prevail. That's what Abraham had to learn. This, this is one of those things that produces hope within us. God's purposes will prevail no matter what. Because it does not depend on you, but on God. Perhaps some of you maybe need to get alone with God this week. You need to come before our gracious and holy and omnipotent and, and compassionate God, the, the, the one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin, and ask him whether or not it is his desire that we should live lives so consumed with fear and worry, right, right, allowing ourselves to be so overwhelmed with discouragement that we often feel as if we are on the sidelines, so overcome by the voice of the enemy within our lives. Look in our Father's eyes, the one who sent his son to bleed and die for us and ask him if it is his desire for us to limp along the way that we do, to live such half-hearted lives, not necessarily fully rejecting the promises of God, but neither fully embracing them either. We want to be people of hope. We must get this right in our hearts that God is true to his purposes and your sin cannot thwart his purposes. God keeps his promises, number one. God is true to his purposes. And then finally, um, God offers his presence. This is the ultimate reason that we have for hope. This is the end, the telos uh, of it all. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place where God himself dwells, behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God keeps his promises. God is true to his purposes. And the ultimate thing that produces hope within us is that odd God offers his presence. We have a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. His name is Jesus. Uh, this, this image of, of, of anchor is an interesting one. Think, typically, we think about an anchor as something that uh, you know, a ship uses, goes down through the water, anchors us whole Holds us tight. The way, the way that the, the, the anchor is used here seems to be something of a, the one commentator said it's kind of like a grappling hook. It's this anchor that is tossed uh, into the temple and behind the inner curtain where, in the Holy of Holies where God himself dwells, goes in there and then holds us tight and brings us in. Um, the, the, I'll tell you though, the, the image that really captivated my attention as I prepared to preach this sermon to you, surprise, surprise, um, is that word forerunner. Forerunner. That Jesus is our forerunner who goes uh, into the temple, into God's presence. So we have here uh, is an image borrowed from the world of running. Now I know what you thought. You thought that maybe I could go at least one sermon without talking about running. Um, how can I help myself if it's right there uh, in the text? <laughs> I didn't plan that, uh, where Jesus has gone as our forerunner uh, on our behalf. So let me, uh, let me preach this, this idea of Jesus as a uh, forerunner. Next uh, Saturday morning, I'll be getting on the uh, starting line to run my very first uh, marathon. Um, you can pray for me uh, next uh, Saturday morning. Pray that uh, God brings me to my senses. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, fully expect that the first 20 miles of that marathon, you run 26.2 miles, 
marathon, but I fully expect the first 20 miles of my marathon will go reasonably well. I've run 20 miles before, uh, but there's a big question mark as to what exactly happens to you uh, physically and then most importantly uh, mentally after you've run about 20 miles and everything is depleted and run out of you. And so you do a lot of mental training to, to think what, what's going to be going through my mind for those last 6.2 uh, miles. And I was thinking about this idea of Jesus as our, as our forerunner. You know, Jesus is the one who has kind of run the race uh, ahead of us. I'm going down to run that uh, race with a running buddy, a young guy. His name is Brendan. Brendan's 24, 25 years old. Kid that's fresh out of uh, college, really fast uh, runner. And I thought, you know, about the time I'm at heading 20 miles and my body's falling apart, uh, maybe I'll think about Brendan, who at that point will probably be coming across the, the finish line uh, and, and relaxing in the, uh, you know, the inner place behind the, the sanctuary, just waiting for me to, to hobble across. And, and maybe that will give me some bit of encouragement. And maybe that gives you some bit of encouragement as well as we think about uh, the right, running the race that is uh, before us, that Jesus is our forerunner, that Jesus has run that race, that Jesus has crossed the finish line, and he stands there at the finish line waiting for you to, uh, to come across. And, and I think that that's it, but that's not quite uh, it. I want you to look at the passage here and I want you to see something even more glorious than just uh, Jesus running ahead of us. Do you see there in verse 20 it says where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. Do you see what it says next? It says on our behalf. On our behalf. In other words, it's not just that Jesus has run the race ahead of us and he stands at the finish line waiting for us to finish. It actually says he's run that race on our uh, behalf. And so I think the better analogy would be something uh, like this. Uh, when I sign up for my uh, marathon next, next, uh, next Saturday, I'll get a, get a bib number. That's my little number that's assigned to me. And on the back, there's a little timing chip. It gets uh, attached to my shirt like, uh, like this. And uh, what this passage would, would say is, uh, I would give this bib to that fastest runner that I know and just say, you attach this to you. <laughs> and you run that race, and when you come across the finish line, the result will read, Billy Haynes broke the marathon record. <laughs> That's what this passage is saying. Right? That's what this, this passage, Jesus has gone as our forerunner on our behalf. It's not just that he's run the same race and stands at the finish line. The promise of the gospel here is that Jesus has run for us. So the race that we have to run is actually a race that has already been won. The, the prize for which we are striving, this eternal presence with God, is already ours. The race that you and I are therefore called to run is a, it's a, more of a victory lap. The race is already over. Jesus has already done it for your be, on, on your behalf. That's what should fill us with hope. We're not striving one day to attain it. Jesus has already done that. What is that victory? What is this victory that Jesus has earned for us? This passage tells us it is being in the presence of God. Let me finish this sermon here by asking you again to, to call in mind that story of Abraham and Isaac. That Isaac carried by Abraham up the mountain. At the last moment they find a ram caught in a thicket and the ram is slaughtered in Abraham's place. You know many years later of course another father, God the Father, would send his son, his only son, whom he loved, up a mountain. And there would be no ram caught in a thicket. But Jesus would freely offer himself up on that mountain for you and I. That's what it means that Jesus is our forerunner who's gone on our behalf. That he has died for us in our place. That's the hope that we have for tomorrow. See, friends, it is true. It's true that the world lives under the shadow of death. It's true that what I expect to happen tomorrow directs my life today. But this passage tells us that we have something better, that we live not just under the shadow of death, but we live in the shadow of the cross. We live in the shadow of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We live in the shadow of eternal life. The victory has already been won. You want to be a person full of hope. Fill your mind and fill your heart with that. I'll leave you with that thought as we come now to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for that image. We thank you for this, this image in, in Genesis 22 of a father coming to the point of offering up his son, his only son, whom he loves. We thank you uh, that you did that for us and went all the way that Jesus gave his entire self up. Oh Lord, we, we can live such half-hearted lives ignorant of your, of your promises, limping our way along through life. Father, I pray that as we dwell with our minds and with our hearts about, upon these gospel truths, even this morning as we come to this supper here this morning, that your promises would become more real to us, that you would help us to put ourselves fully uh, into those promises, into what your word has revealed. Fill us with this kind of hope. Jesus, we, we long to have this hope that is set before us. Fill us, and I pray that even even in this moment, even in these moments that we have left together in this worship service, that you would begin to do the, that. Show us where we have settled. Show us where we are limping along. Show us where, where we're just living half-hearted lives. Jesus, we, we look to you. We thank you for the victory that you have already won. Fill us with that. Fill us with the, that hope, even as we partake here of the Lord's Supper. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.